ladies and gentlemen, I am coming at you from the Pacific Northwest to bring you commentary about current events, politics, culture, and economics that can affect your life, liberty, and security. I hope you are having a great day. I know I am. My day is fantastic. I have a home, I have food, I have a girlfriend, I have a dog. What else could I ask for other than a 1967 Ford Mustang and a billion dollars? Nothing really. Today we're going to talk about boring things, mostly economics. If you get bored by economics, don't worry. I do too. I 100% fully understand. So I'll start with this sort of introduction where I talk about nothing in particular. I'll call it the message of the day. Life is hard. Life is a big struggle. Struggles will never go away. That's one of the downfalls of being a human. Trust me, it doesn't matter what animal or creature you are on this planet. Survival will always be on our mind. As humans, we are vulnerable creatures. We are threatened by poverty, accidents, ill intentions of others, sickness, emotions, and so much more. That's why life is hard. Even if you have more than enough money, emotions will still get to you. Economic collapse could still get to you. Being rich won't prevent you from getting sick. Someone could still murder you. You're still prone to accidents. This message isn't to give you a melancholy mood of gloom and doom. Instead, this message is to highlight the realistic notion that you are not alone in this world. Everyone goes through struggles. That doesn't mean that your problems are irrelevant. It just means that when you go out in the real world, you should operate on the understanding that you are not the only one. Look around you. Life is hard for everybody. We're on the brink of chaos. The blanket of order could collapse from one single brisk event. And yet, here we are, still going on about our day to day lives. When you really think about it, it is amazing that our society, our civilization, can still operate the way it does. Understanding this idea, I can sleep peacefully at night. It gives me optimism. So, do you want to know what it's like to live in a tyrannical country? Or a country that is on the fast track to tyranny? I don't mean it to say that the United States is equivalent to the USSR or that the United States is equivalent to living under the Saddam Hussein regime. It's not equivalent to living in North Korea. There are a lot of things that makes the United States better than any other country in the world. One of those things is the Bill of Rights. We have a legal framework of rights. We have a legal framework of a way of protecting our rights from the government, from tyranny, from corporations. That's what makes this country one of the greatest. However, in practice, sometimes legal frameworks don't always work. It doesn't matter what system you set up. You can have a form of government and it will generally always grow into something tyrannical. It'll take over some aspect of your life. Now, with that being said, the absence of government creates a vacuum for a power-hungry tyrant to take over. People want a leader, people want to be told what to do, or people just want some sort of wisdom, some sort of guide. So getting rid of the state isn't an option either. <clears throat> but I said at the beginning of this, do you want to know what it's like to live in a country that is tyrannical or on the fast track to becoming tyrannical? Well, just, just listen to this. Why'd you shoot me? Amy Hughes, screaming and bleeding, asked Officer Andrew Casella after he fired four rounds at her through a chain link fence. Thanks to the Supreme Court, a jury will not get a chance to consider that question. 
in a case that illustrates how hard it is to hold police officers responsible for using excessive force, the court on Monday ruled that Casella is protected by qualified immunity from civil liability for the injuries he inflicted on Hughes in May 2010. The decision, as Justice Sonia Sotomayor observed, in a dissent joined by Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, tells officers that they can shoot first and think later. Now, I understand for the people that support the thin blue line, not, not the ones that are saying, hey, that we shouldn't just say that all police are bad, but the law is bad. Some of the training is bad. Regardless if you support the thin blue line, let me play devil's advocate first and extend an olive branch, and then let me explain my position where I am coming from. Yes, it's true that cops have a stressful job. Sometimes police officers do not have the luxury of waiting for something to happen. With that being said, we should hold police officers responsible. Why? Because if any cop could just act on a whim on his emotions or instincts, you could see an increase of people being shot by authority, by people with a badge, because they have a monopoly on violence and on force, as it should be, but with that gives them a huge margin of error. There is so much that can happen that can cause an unlawful shooting that can cause somebody who really didn't break any laws being shot or somebody who did break a law but still didn't get still the situation didn't warrant them getting shot with projectiles from a firearm so I do understand that being a cop is hard there are certain situations where Sometimes you do not have the luxury of sitting there, standing there, whatever it may be, and thinking. But, like I said, with that understanding, it is still appropriate that we keep these people who are in a position of authority over us, that have a badge, that have a certificate of approval, of permission, to use force. That's a scary thing. That's a scary concept. <clears throat> Casella, an officer with the University of Arizona Police Department in Tucson, was responding to a Czech welfare call with about a woman who was hacking at a tree with a kitchen knife, arriving at that home Arriving at the home that Hughes shared with Sharon Chadwick, he saw Hughes emerge from the house with a kitchen knife in her hand and approach Chadwick, stopping about six feet from her. Hughes, who talked to Chadwick but did not seem angry, was holding the knife at her side with the blade pointed away from her housemate. Chadwick, who later described Hughes as composed and content, said she never felt she was in any danger. Chadwick said it seemed to her that Hughes did not understand what was happening, an impression shared by Casella's colleagues. The cops, although in uniform, never verbally identified themselves as police officers, and the whole encounter was over within a minute. Casella, who later said he was trying to protect Chadwick, opened fire immediately and without warning, hitting Hughes with all four bullets. She survived, but easily could have been killed. Neither of the two of the two other officers at the scene, let me say that again. Neither of the two other officers at the scene resorted to deadly force. Casella could have used his taser instead of his gun. He could have repeated the command to drop the knife. He could have at least warned Hughes that if she did not comply, he would fire. So when I extended an olive branch, when I said I understand that sometimes as a cop, you do not have the luxury of standing there and waiting until something happens to use your authority 
or your permission to authority to dismantle the situation. Is dismantle the word I'm looking for? It works. As a cop, your job is to deconstruct what is going on and then dismantling the situation in a peaceful way, if possible. Sometimes you don't have the luxury to think, because sometimes it can go bad. Because you're in a cop, your, your job is to be in danger on the front lines. But with that being said, this single cop had no reason to shoot this lady. As far as I can tell, holding a knife is legal. Chadwick, the person that lives with Hughes, or lived with Hughes, said she didn't feel threatened. Or is it a he? Regardless, Chadwick's, yeah, Sharon Chadwick, she said she didn't feel threatened. She said she didn't feel like her life was in danger. And the other two police officers, they didn't shoot either. So there is a moment where you have the luxury to think, but you don't think. Instead, you act on a whim. And I know that these situations or these events will probably always happen regardless, it, regar regardless of police training. But this person should be held responsible. And the courts, <laughs> they said, shoot first and think later. I could understand if... You're pulling somebody over who's a suspect to a robbery, a bank robbery at gunpoint, and then they jump out of the car with something in their hand, and then you open fire. I don't think that's something that you should do because we saw the man who jumped out of his car with a wallet who got shot. <clears throat> I think that cop's a piece of crap. Regardless, I understand that more so than I understand somebody who is not violent who is holding a knife property on their own property some through a fence <laughs> getting shot that's what I have a problem with and then the court's saying yeah no it's okay go ahead and shoot you can think later no no it's fine we we get that you have a family to go home to it's not like everybody else you're dealing with has a family to go home to at the moment she was shot, Hughes had committed no crime and was not menacing anyone. After Hughes sued Casella under federal law, that allows people to recover damages for violations of their constitutional rights. The U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit concluded that a rational jury could find that she had a constitutional right to walk down her driveway holding a knife without being shot. Well, yes, of course you have a right. You have the Second Amendment. You have the right to bear arms. You have the right to have firearms on your own property. And in this case, she had a knife and was walking down the driveway, who apparently, according to the two other officers at the time, and then the person that lived in the same residence as the person who was shot, who was holding a knife, said that their life wasn't threatened. They didn't feel threatened. Not to mention it was also through a chain link fence. Regardless of the situation, even if the shooting was warranted, the courts giving permission for a police officer to shoot first and ask questions later is dangerous. That's the type of mentality that I would expect soldiers to have overseas if I was the commander-in-chief and my Congress had declared war. That's something I would expect. I would say, okay, listen, we're overseas, we are declaring war, shoot first to ask questions later. Destroy the enemy. Destroy them. Blow them off the face of the earth so they are no longer a threat. But this isn't overseas, this isn't a foreign country, this is the United States of America where you have a reasonable expectation of safety. You can hold a knife without being considered a threat. 
You can hold a knife without being shot. There's so many ways to deal with this. This isn't Taliban. This isn't Al-Qaeda. This woman wasn't a part of ISIS. She might have been mentally disturbed. I don't know. Maybe she snapped. She didn't kill anybody. She didn't seem threatening, according to the officers that did not shoot her, according to the person that she lives with. But whatever, I digress. Casella appealed to the Supreme Court, which did not address the question of whether he had used excessive force, even if he did. Seven justices agreed Casella cannot be held liable because of the Ninth Circuit's precedence as of May 2010 had not clearly established that shooting Hughes violated her rights. That's absurd. I think I've already explained why. While none of the Ninth Circuit's cases addressing excessive force involved circumstances exactly like these, that does not mean Casella had no way of knowing that what he did was unlawful. Because Casella plainly lacked any legitimate interest justifying the use of deadly force against a woman who posed no objective threat of harm. Two officers, or others, had committed no crime and appeared calm and collected during the police encounter, Sotomayor writes. He was not entitled to qualified immunity. The Supreme Court's conclusion, to the contrary, is part of a pattern in recent California Law Review article. University of Chicago Law Professor William Bodd notes that the court almost always sides with government officials in qualified immunity cases, which makes judges less likely to let people sue them, as illustrated by criminal cases in which juries let cops off the hook for outrageous conduct. Giving victims of excessive force their day in court hardly guarantees justice, but preventing juries from hearing cases like these guarantees injustice. Yes, so imagine... The court saying, yeah, you're on your own property, you're holding a knife, there appears to be no threat. Uh, the other subject who lives with this person didn't feel threatened. The individual seemed calmed and collective. The other two cops didn't see a threat either, apparently. So, you would think that she has a right not to get shot. And let's just let's make sure. <clears throat> Let's ask a few basic questions, and then let's ask what rights does she have that we can use to apply to her right to not get shot, which was obviously violated. Why was she shot? Why did only one cop shoot? What law did she break? What law did she violate? What reasoning? Why did she break this law if she broke a law? Why did the cop feel the need to shoot somebody who really didn't break a law? So let's talk about the Fourth Amendment. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation and particularly describing the place to be searched and the persons or things to be seized. Now that's not that's not entirely relevant, but it but it it solidifies the fact of property rights. That she was on her property. And effectively you can see that she was seized in a manner. The only reason they really had was that she was wielding a knife and I say so what? You can walk into any grocery store at the age of frickin 12 and buy a kitchen knife from self-checkout you will not get ID'd you know why because a knife is not illegal to own you can you need knives for various things cutting cutting food <laughs> it's that simple now let's look on the fifth amendment something that, that should be apparently obvious no person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime unless on a presentment or indictment of a grand jury except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in the militia when in actual service in time of war or public danger nor shall any person be subject for the same offense 
to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. So, the Fifth Amendment goes over things about uh, when you're able to be punished, when your life, liberty, and property shall be used against you, or shall be seized. It's when when you break a law, also, uh, double jeopardy. It outlaws that. You can't be charged for the same crime twice. And it also talks about uh, eminent domain. The ability for the government to seize your property if you haven't committed a crime. Basically, what the Fifth Amendment says is that, uh, yeah, you need to have break in a law in order for your life, liberty, and property to be threatened. You need to have break in a law. And if you're on your own property holding a knife, not in danger to anybody, you have the expectation to live. <laughs> Your life should not be threatened. You have an expectation of, of life, liberty, and property. But, because courts err on the side of... Courts err on the side of uh, the cops, almost always. That's what we get. So, before somebody is targeted by the police... There needs to be reasonable suspicion. What law did they break? Are they actually posing a threat? And if a cop makes a bad call, to some extent they should be held accountable. Now understand that if you're a police officer, like I said, let me extend this olive branch one last time. Mistakes will be made because that's part of the job. It's scary that it can happen. But sometimes there's not always the intention of ill will. There's not always um, the intention of malice. So let's talk about the Sixth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment. So the Fifth Amendment, the, the Fourth Amendment says that your your property and your papers should be secure. Basically, your right to privacy. The Fifth Amendment says that in order for you to be tried, in order for your life, liberty, or property to be tried, you need to have broken the law due process it is due process you shall not go to jail without being told why you're going to jail without being tried for breaking a law so let's talk about the sixth amendment in all criminal prosecutions the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed which a district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witness against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance, of course, for his defense. So, of course, this is an extension of the rule of law. And in this case, the rule of law was pretty much bypass on the side of police officers so let's talk about qualified immunity basically qualified immunity is a type of legal immunity qualified immunity balances two important interests the need to hold public officials accountable when they exercise power irresponsibly and the need to shield officials from harassment distraction and liability when they perform their duties reasonably that came from the court case of Pearson versus Callahan. Specifically, qualified immunity protects a government official from lawsuits, alleging that the official violated a plaintiff's rights, only allowing suits where, where uh, officials violated a clearly established statutory or constitutional right, like being secure in your persons and your property, <laughs> like uh, due process. <clears throat> um... When determining whether or not the right was clearly established, courts consider whether a hypothetical 
reasonable official would have known that the defendant's conduct violated the plaintiff's rights. Courts conducting this analysis apply the law that was in force at the time of the alleged violation, not the law in effect when the court considers the case. Qualified immunity is not immunity from having to pay money damages, but rather immunity from having to go through the cost of a trial at all. Accordingly, courts must resolve qualified immunity issues as early in a case as possible, preferably before discovery. Qualified immunity only applies to suits against government officials as individuals, not suits against the government for damages caused by the official's actions. Which makes sense. Um... Although qualified immunity frequently appears in cases involving police officers, it also applies to most other executive branch officials. While judges, prosecutors, legislators, and some other government officials do not receive qualified immunity, most are protected by other immunity doctrines. So let's go over just some of the court cases about qualified immunity and how it applies to this specific case. Harlow v. Fitzgerald, 457 U.S. 800 in 1982, police are free from lawsuits if their actions fall within the scope of their job. Okay, so keeping the peace, de-escalating or de-escalation of uh, events, protecting your rights, protecting your life, liberty, and property, shooting a woman holding a knife who holds no threat is not within the scope of your job. It just isn't. Especially if you have a reasonable expectation to be safe on your own property and everybody else around you is like, yeah, no, it, this person didn't pose a threat. And they were shot through a fence. Malley versus Briggs, or Briggs, sorry. Malley versus Briggs, 457, U.S. 355, 1986. Police officers are not protected under qualified immunity if they act on a faulty warrant, wrongfully arrest someone, or if there was no reasonable suspicion. So far, the only reasonable suspicion was that she was a little crazy because she was hacking at a tree with a knife. And she was holding a knife on her own property. But just because you're holding a knife and you might be a little unstable, it doesn't justify the use of force to end your life, especially when you deserve due process to prove that you have broken a law. Anderson v. Creighton, 483 U.S. 635, 1987. Officers are protected by qualified immunity if they violate your Fourth Amendment if it's based on probable cause. Meaning, if a police officer is driving through the neighborhood and they see they see something suspicious like they see somebody breaking the window of your say you're not home somebody is breaking the window of your house okay they are breaking the window of your house and they are entering entering through your front door then it's probably reasonable that the officer might go knock on the door enter the house to protect your property because hey this masked individual who looks awfully like a burglar broke into your house. That violates the Fourth Amendment. Or, if you are running from the police, you're a suspected... You get pulled over because you're a suspected bank robber. And you speed off, and the police chase you, and you run into your house. The police have a reason, reasonable suspicion, to run into your house after you. Even though it's your own property. Because, hey, you're a suspected bank robber, you were caught, and you're fleeing from the police. That's reasonable suspicion. What a cop cannot do, however, is go up to your house and say, Hey, I think there's weed in here. I'm coming in. They can't do that unless they actually think there's weed. So, for instance, somebody calls and reports, Hey, there's a weed smell. And then the police show up and, Hey, guess what? They smell weed. Then they can legally come in. Now, I think weed should be legalized, but that's besides the point. That's explaining reasonable suspicion. Safford Unified School District, number one, versus Reading. 129 St. Clair. I think it's St. No. Uh, I'm not sure what that, what, what that abbreviation is. Uh, 263. This was a court case in 2009. At school, teachers and school staff may search your stuff for illicit items. Now, I think that's bullcrap, but that's besides the point. But that's just to give you an idea of what qualifying immunity covers. Basically, there has to be reasonable suspicion, or you have to be a minor at school. You know, 
They need to be under the guise of protecting the public. But if you're standing on your property with a knife and two other officers don't shoot you because, well, there's really not a reasonable threat, there is not a reasonable suspicion that you're actually going to hurt somebody, there's still a chance of the situation, whatever it may be, being de-escalated, then the cops have an obligation to de-escalate the position, the, the, the situation, rather than shooting you. When one out of three officers shoots, instead of two out of three, you know there's a problem. When the person who is involved with the person wielding the knife says, hey, my life didn't feel threatened, you know that something is wrong. So Rand Paul might save us all. Republican Kentucky Senator Rand Paul announced on Wednesday, by the way, this was in the beginning of April, uh, this article is written on the 11th of April. Several days have passed by. I haven't been able to cover this story yet, so there's that, in case you're wondering. Anyway, um, Republican Kentucky Senator Rand Paul announced that he plans to introduce a bill that would balance the budget within five years. The chairman of the Federal Spending Oversight and Emergency Management Subcommittee for the Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee says the bill will cut spending across the board while implementing entitlement and welfare reform. Paul, who has consistently supported tax cuts as well as spending cuts, says his bill will bring our fiscal house in order, noting that Congress passed a budget last year that failed to balance and added hundreds of billions of dollars to the debt. The recent spending bill is even worse. Paul says Congress does not appear to have any plans to craft a budget for 2019. However, according to the current Senate rules, if leadership of the budget committees does not introduce a budget, a senator can. No more trillion dollar deficits, he said. No more adding to the 21 trillion debt that burdens our country and our children and our grandchildren adding to this massive debt isn't what I signed up for and it isn't what the people voted for. In February, Paul was critical of the $1.3 trillion spending bill, voted against voting against the bill, and holding a hearing to discuss wasteful government spending. How can Congress do proper oversight of spending when we throw everything into one giant trillion dollar bill? Paul asked in February. Congress is supposed to take a close look at 12 appropriation bills, funding specific areas of government, and debate and amend them. The Government Shutdown Prevention Act, S-2339, a bill introduced by Paul earlier in the year, encouraged Congress to properly consider and debate any new legislation involving federal government spending. Paul said Republicans need to keep their word to the voters by reining in spending and shrinking the deficit. For me, it wasn't just campaign talk, he concluded. I'm going to do it, and I'm going to force a vote on the floor of the U.S. Senate, and we'll see who actually really does believe in balancing the budget. Rand Paul, okay, ladies and gentlemen, sorry, is one of those consistent Republicans. When Republicans campaign on cutting the budget, cutting spending, getting our fiscal house in order. Rand Paul is one of the only senators who has consistently done exactly what he said he was going to do. Cut taxes, decrease spending, but for some reason the other Republicans in office who campaigned on all these things aren't playing ball. Do you know why that is? Because they are spineless. They are cowards. Because unfortunately, with the way our government is right now, with the amount of spending we have, it is almost impossible to decrease the budget without having consequences. So they're spineless and are unwilling to take power back from the president and get their fiscal house in order. That is one reason. They are spineless cowards. And the second reason is because if the fiscal house is in order, there's really nothing as strong to campaign on. Americans hate having all this tax money being taken from them. You can argue the necessity for taxes. That is 100% fine. That is 100% justifiable. Sure, we need taxes for infrastructure, for police, for military, for courts. Fine. But they take so much more and spend it on so much more than just that. Our military spending is through the roof. 
We don't need that big of a military budget. <laughs> our military is fine. We have technology on our side. We have the brains on our side. We should have the economy on our side. We have the homeland on our side. We have 50 different national guards and we have 300 private arms in circulation. Nobody is invading us. Never ever. It will never happen. The only way somebody will challenge us is through trade or through proxy wars. That's it. So Rand Paul is one of the only senators who is consistent. I can name two congressmen who are consistent. Thomas Massey of Kentucky and Justin Amash of Michigan. Those are the only two congressmen I could think of that put their money where their mouth is, what they campaigned on. And ladies and gentlemen, understand that... Sure, it's nice to have lower taxes, but you need to look at the national debt as well. I support cutting taxes, and I support getting the national debt under control. Is that possible? Yes, it is possible. Shrink the federal government. But there are consequences to of not balancing the budget. There's consequences to having higher taxes. Okay, let, let, let's look at consequences of balancing the budget. Okay, um, That might be higher taxes, and there might be less funding for important things. So th those are consequences that we might face if we attempt to balance the budget. Rand Paul thinks that he can balance the budget without raising taxes, and I think he probably can too, but that will take sacrifices. But So I just went over the consequences of balancing the budget. Possibly a slight higher tax rate and maybe less funding for more important things. But there are more consequences of having a national debt. Now I can't get into too much detail, but I will keep this I'll keep this as part of the stack and I will talk about in a separate video, specifically just designed for this, the consequences of growing a national debt, of having it expand so much more. Basically, a national debt is when you're spending more than you are raising in revenue, which is bad. But some of the consequences of having a national debt include lower national savings and income, higher interest payments leading to large tax hikes and spending cuts, decreased ability to respond to problems, and greater risk of a fiscal crisis. Basically, the more money that the government is using to pay down the national debt, we don't have the money to take care of our infrastructure, which is very important for the economy. We don't have enough money to fund our defense to do the to do the basic functions that a government needs higher tax rates uh, you know to pay off a national debt harms individuals for for the supply side of economics for all you marxist marxists out there or keynesians i think it's keynesian whatever for all you uh spending 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 advocates out there that think that the more people consume, the better the economy does. A national debt isn't the way to go because you have to raise the tax rates for the consumer in order to pay off that national debt because it's so huge. So lowering the tax rate for the middle class and lower class gives them more money to consume to spend. So for you supply side e economists out there, there you go, that's number one. For anybody who is, uh, um, oh sorry, that's the demand side the demand side. I'm sorry, I screwed up. Now, for the supply side, the businesses that create jobs, let me tell you how the economy actually functions. Going out and spending stuff it doesn't make the economy go better. It doesn't make the economy boom. It might temporarily feel good. That's why I call a steroid boost or a boost of adrenaline for the economy. Because if the economy did do better and people were spending money, then that means everybody could go and take out debt buy a house, buy a car, stuff they can't afford, and the economy would be doing good. But that's not how it works. The economy does good the more you produce. The more production, the better the economy is. The more you save, the better the economy is. And I will explain that. I know the saving part doesn't make sense. But production, this is why it's beneficial for the economy. I don't know where it's at. I'm going to look up the story, and next time I have an episode, I'll talk, I'll talk more in detail about it. But, you know, we grow in certain areas so much potatoes that we can't, that it's not even worth shipping it because people won't buy them. Because we won't sell them. That's how plentiful potatoes are. So, what you know what they do? They dump it in this field. And I'll, I'll look up the story for you, don't worry. But you know what happens to those potatoes that aren't even worth trucking or shipping because there's so much of them? and they won't even make a profit. They dump it in the field, which is cheaper, and guess what you can do? You can go to the field and get free potatoes. That's what you can do. That is production. Guess what? Those potatoes are so cheap 
There is more than can be consumed, so you get free potatoes. That is post-scarcity. Imagine not having to work and you get free potatoes. If you just wanted to live off of potatoes, you could. You could just live off of potatoes. I mean, there might not be a variety, but you would never starve again because the amount of potatoes that we produce is so high. So production makes the standard of living cheaper for most people. Now let's talk about saving. Saving is really important because if you don't have anything to spend money on, you're keeping it in a bank. And what that bank will do with your money, which is the way banks make money, is they will, let's say you have $12,000 in the bank. Somebody wants to buy a used car for $6,000, so the bank loans out your $6,000. But there's an interest rate on it. And let's say they make the interest rate high enough to where they'll make a $500 profit off of loaning out your $6,000. So somebody needs a car that costs $6,000, the bank loans out $6,000, and the person who got the loan for $6,000 might pay an interest of, might end up paying for total about 6200 to 6500 depending on the interest rates. So your money will make that bank an extra 200 to 500 bucks. And as a result, the bank makes money. You get some of that money into your savings or checking your savings account as interest because your money was used to make money. And the person who bought a car is now able to be more productive. And apply that concept to business owners. Somebody has an idea. They want to implement that idea. So they borrow money from the bank, a business loan, and then they start producing and then they pay off that loan plus interest. And then they're producing stuff for the economy if their business gets off the ground. Production is what makes the economy go. Now, I, I, I agree there is an argument to be made for supply side, or uh, sorry, consumer side, demand side, because otherwise production doesn't matter, but that's so minuscule compared to how much production plays a role in the economy. I kind of went on a tangent, but with a national debt, it means there's less money that people are saving. It means that there's less money that's going on infrastructure, which makes the economy run. It means there's less, mo there's less money being used for personal investments by individuals and businesses. That's what a national debt means. It means this money that is going to pay off a tr $20 trillion a 20 plus trillion dollar debt will never be used to grow the economy. Instead it will be used to paying off a debt that your children will have to pay. That is why it is so crucial that we pay off the national debt because eventually at some point the national debt will grow and consume us. Alright, thank you guys for watching the Logan for Liberty podcast. I hope you all have a wonderful day. It's not all gloom and doom out there. It's not all doom and gloom. We live in a pretty great world. We live in a world where, where you almost have everything at your fingertips. So make the best of it and try to get ahead of any doom that is coming. Have a good one.